but the uh, screen is perfectly vis visible now. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let me just check if I stop the video, then uh, that's all right too, right? Nothing, not, you're not losing the screen or no glitches no, no. or anything. No, no. Fine. Okay, so let me, uh, I'll, I'll stop the video once, uh, once I start the presentation. Is yeah, okay? sure. Okay. Oh, okay, fine. I just want to make sure everyone is here from R3 and then uh, maybe if we still have a minute. So let me just check if Professor Ghosh is here. No, um, he's, so we'll just... Uh, Start once Professor Ghosh uh, comes. Once a sec. I think he should be just there. I'll just give him a call. Okay, so I'm just, uh, I think it's time to start and Professor Ghosh is also joining. So um, I would, I really want to thank uh, Professor Indranil Das Gupta for uh, giving this talk at Adri today. Uh, these are unusual circumstances, but I think one of the benefits is that we get to hear such uh, interesting topics uh, right from our homes. And uh, we hope uh, that uh, we'll have some very good discussions after the talk as well. So I would not spend a lot of time talking about the paper or Professor Das Gupta. All of you know about him. It, is, it was circulated in the email. Uh, so Professor Das Gupta, I would just request you to uh, begin your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Asmita. And... Uh... Thank you for inviting me here, uh, even if online. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to present my work in front of you. And uh, I understand that this is a multidisciplinary audience. So I really like feedback on the broad research agenda that we are pursuing here from the non-economists in the audience, because because the topic obviously is something that goes far beyond standard standard economics, quote unquote, as it is usually defined. I have an, about an hour, right, Asmita? Yes, you have about an hour. Okay, so uh, I'd be happy to take questions, clarificatory questions as I go along. And of course, we can have a more, uh, more extended discussion Half, uh, once, once I finish presenting. So the uh, 
Hey, this is joint work with Shomishta Pal, who's at University of Surrey, and uh, it's forthcoming in the Journal of Comparative Economics, but it's part of a broader research agenda that we have been chasing for the last two, three years, and there are quite a lot of open issues here that I think would be would be wonderful to to clear up over uh, over the coming years. So it's it's a very much a wide open set of research questions that we throw up through this particular paper. So what's the basic question that we want to look at here? It's simple. We all know that despite the constitution outlawing the practice of uh, untouchability immediately after independence. In practice, uh, a lot of that still exists, especially in rural India. Now, what exactly is it that determines the prevalence of the practice among Hindu upper castes and OBCs? That's our question. And uh, let me start with a caveat. As you will see when I throw in some numbers, there is, there is a significant amount of uh, the practice among uh, other social groups apart from Hindu upper caste and OBCs, but that's something we are not going to look at for obvious reasons, the, that being that the prevalence is, law, is more extensive amongst these social groups. So. To finesse the question a bit, is it only the individual or household characteristics of, of the household or the individual that determine how likely the individual or the household is to practice untouchability? Now, this is the kind of fact uh, that a recent paper in EPW by Thorat and Joshi, this was the working paper version, the final version came out last year. Uh, this is a tack that uh, Thorat and Joshi take, where they look at various characteristics of the households and try to figure out which of these characteristics are associated strongly with a household's propensity to practice untouchability. The approach that, that we want to take is in some sense more structured. That is, we want to figure out whether the distribution of power, and what I mean by power will become clear as I go along, but at, at this level, just, just, just sort of let me throw in the word. Is it the distribution of group power or the distribution of power across the various social groups within the village that also plays a role here? That is, is it likely to be the case that, a, that two households with very similar characteristics otherwise might be expected to behave very differently with regard to untouchability, depending on the structure of village level power, community power across religious and caste groups. That's the, that's the question that we want to chase up. And that's how we differ from the only other other work that we are aware of in this area, which is Thorat and Joshi. Sorry, uh, Indranilda, if I yeah. may interrupt. Yeah. What do you mean by power? Here? Like I said, give me 10 minutes. Okay. okay. At this stage, just sort of take it very loosely and I'm going to formalize it as I go along. All right. Any other question? Okay. So, the, now, why is it that the literature on, uh, on untouchability per se, the practice of untouchability is so scant? 
we all know that there is a pretty large literature on uh, on cost as such various aspects of cost both its economic rationale as well as its economic consequences especially in the context of distribution of uh, uh, in the or access to resources or labor markets but there is really very little work on the kind of question that we are asking here except for the paper by thorat and joshi and that's primarily because the uh, because of the absence of data now we really did not have any large scale country wide data set on the practice till very recently it's only the last uh, ihd is the india uh also survey of 2011 uh 12 which had a question which went like, like uh, which was basically the surveyor asked the the respondents as to whether they or somebody in their household practiced untouchability there was a secondary question which which had to do with uh, whether right, it would be problematic if uh, if somebody from um, uh, from sc communities entered the kitchen we don't look at the second uh, second uh, response because that takes us into us into a finer level of analysis but we just look at uh, we just use the data from this response the india ihds 21 uh, 2011 12 survey for our purposes now obviously there are problems with uh, with self response there are obvious problems with apne se so is there a question ye kya abhi live chal raha hai Hi Barbara, I see you have joined. Yeah. Okay, so um, so the there are obvious questions, uh, issues, with the very broad nature of the question. There are obvious issues with self uh, self response, but this is really the best one can do given the current state of the data. so that's what we have to run with the issue then is if it is not the case as we posit or hypothesize that only individual or household characteristics matter in determining how likely one is to practice untouchability and it is the case that rather it's the case that more structural features i e the distribution of village level power across different social and caste groups with power to be for rigorously defined in a, in a minute uh then what's our entry point our conceptual or uh, theoretic or uh, analytical entry point is the starts from the following a motivating backdrop we all know that conflicts between caste conflicts conflicts between scs and upper castes or obcs are a major constitutive feature of indian political reality and social reality we also know that conflicts between hindus and muslims constitute another constit- constituting constitutive feature of indian reality now these kinds of conflicts provide the backdrop within which we want to organize the analysis so our entry point is the idea that the legitimacy of caste exclusionary in the hindu behavioral norms of which the practice of untouchability is one that legitimacy is often contested at the village level so 
the extent to which the local the social Am I back? Uh, Asmita, I think... Uh, yes, you got disconnected. Now I can yes. just forget. Okay, now I'm back. Okay, fine. Yeah. So... Yeah. So, uh, uh, the outcomes of this caste contest ha would, however, be also affected by simultaneous religious conflict between Hindus and Muslims. So we have, as a sort of a conceptual backdrop, what we have in mind is kind of a theoretic, uh, 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 three, three uh, party, a tripartite contest between upper caste and OBCs on the one hand. Sorry, uh, Indranita, to uh, disturb yeah. you. Uh, you need to share your screen again, I think. We lost, uh, oh, sorry, I lost it, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yes, we can see it now, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's come back. Okay. Can you just reduce the size a bit? But I think it's fine. No problem. You want me to reduce it? No, no, I think uh, it's fine. No problem. Okay. Uh, just... okay. So, uh, if that is indeed the case, then the incidence of untouchability would be impacted by village level differences in distribution of resources and therefore political power. So now I'm getting to a more uh, rigorous uh, notion of power. And by power then, what I'll mean is, what I'll focus on is two things. One, numbers, population share, and two, physical resources, uh, some proxy for wealth, and of course, in the context of land, the natural thing to do would be to look at the proportion of village land owned by any particular community. So, in our formulation, political power of each group is some function of its population share within the village and its share of total land holding within the village. That okay, Asmita? Happy now? Yes, thanks. So I was wondering yeah. if these are also correlated with political power. I, I think these were these that. That is the how we 
we rationalize uh, our choice of power markers because uh, in uh, at a very basic level numbers would seem to matter in political political conflicts or electorally <laughs> at the same time money also matters video chal raha hai ha chal raha hai sorry about that no 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 it's okay am i audible yeah 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 okay so political th- think of this as political power in a loose sense terms of what might determine electoral electoral strength that's a function of both men and money voters and resources so these is a uh, population proportion is a proxy for numerical strength and uh, and land share is a proxy for wealth the uh, wealth in our context and uh, in a more uh, rigorous sense in our model there will be a one to one correspondence between our formulation of a measure of community power which is a function of uh, of uh, population share and land share and the success of that community in each and every one of the conflicts it participates in so since there is a one to one correspondence between success in the conflict and our measure of political power we are we can identify political power with our measure of resource endowments in the context of our model okay ashmita yeah thank you all right so, so that's the first uh-huh. line huh there is one so, more question in the chat uh-huh. box i don't know okay. like uh, if you like to uh uh let let me just have a look at the chat box no it's, i can uh, i can raise it actually i want that it's kasturi here please could you clarify what you mean by simultaneous religious conflict between hindus and muslims i mean surely this would be contextually driven in the, in the, in the, and not the, universal and politically no, no, obvious, obviously not but at the level uh, sort of at the modeling level that's what we want to at the at sort of the birds eye broad picture kind of story that we want to rig, rig around this theme we are, we want to highlight the fact that whether there is a powerful non hindu block present in the village seems to matter okay matter for how upper caste hindus treat scs upper caste or obcs so that is the sense in which we are talking about a process of conflict between a, a process of religious conflict conditioning a process of uh, of caste conflict obviously the, the, we are not we don't mean this literally it's not like you have uh, caste riots and uh, communal riots going on at the same time but it's a, it's it's sort of the broader political tensions and political mobilization um mobilization across these two identity divides that we we sort of want to want to chase up and and um and uh, so throw up as possible possible um, determinants of untouchability okay. right so are you saying that it's a trigger that religious conflict can also trigger and reinforce yeah. it's yeah. it's no, i won't use the word trigger okay. right. because and uh, uh, we have in mind more a uh, more of a process of constant low intensity conflict right trigger Thank trigger you. would suggest something like a riot right not necessarily yeah but that's fine please go ahead okay yeah, yeah. any other question Mm-hmm. 
Okay, so the oh apart God. from the Thorat and Joshi paper, which is uh, which, as I mentioned, uh, looks at just household characteristics, there are uh, two other papers which are close to our work. One is a paper by Sivan oh. Anderson, which yes, came out in America. Uh, American e Economic Journal and uh, another one by Iverson and a, a bunch of other people, EDCC 2014, they look at how upper caste dominance within a village affects the economic performance of lower caste households. So the spirit of their analysis is very similar. Their, their entire, the thrust of their argument is that how lower caste households perform economically in terms of, uh, let's say, uh, average household income. Controlling for everything else, that also seems to vary uh, according to the level of upper caste dominance within the village. So it's not just the, the individual household endowments the standard things you throw it uh, uh, throw into the uh, regression like education level of schooling uh, ownership of land at the household level it's not just these things but also in some sense a broader structural power of different groups makes a difference so the thrust of their argument is pretty similar to ours but uh, they don't address untouchability at all and uh, also, in terms of uh, their notion of uh, dominance of power, they concentrate en uh, entirely on uh, land holdings. But uh, in our formulation, numbers matter as well. So it's a broader notion of caste power and, of course, is a specific focus on untouchability. And third, the aspect of uh, non-Hindu groups, the presence or the strength of non-Hindu groups making a difference, that is something that's completely unique to our analysis. So that's, that's where we come in. Now, uh, before going into the model and the regressions, let me just sort of... Uh, give you some numbers which we calculated from the IHDS uh, 1112. As I said, it's the first nationwide survey to include information on whether the respondent households practice untouchability. The numbers are come from, as I said, uh, from the household. So obviously there, there is a major possibility of underreporting. But since our basic analysis would be a comparative static kind of story. What we really need is not the actual numbers or the proportions who practice untouchability. So long as the ranking across the village, the village level rankings in terms of the incidence of the of the practice does not change, does not change, we are fine. So what we really need, uh, if, if let's say in every village, households were uh, households under reported by a factor of let's say 10%, that's fine. Doesn't make any difference for an analysis. It may even be the case that in some villages there was greater under reporting even that is more or less okay for us, provided the ranking of villages with, res with respect to the uh, proportion of households who admit to practicing untouchability, so long as that ranking does not change. It's a bit like the standard thing economists do in, uh, let's say, demand analysis. It's, uh, it's really the agents ranking over alternative consumption bundles or alternative uh, alternative um, choices uh, alternative feasible choices that is relevant 
the utility function is unique up to a monotone transformation, which microeconomists keep uh, saying from day one of undergraduate microeconomics, meaning basically simply that it's a ranking that which matters, not the strength of the uh, of the, the benefit or anything like that. That's all. That's the same thing. Same thing is happening here. So self. Uh, Self-categorization is obviously problematic, but it's Sir? actually not as problematic for us as Sir, can I ask might. a question? Of course. Uh, so you are considering a monotonic uh, function for this uh, preference of the household or practicing of the household towards untouchability. But what not if the, the household. households no. practice untouchability for people with, uh, say, lower wealth, a uh, lower proportion of wealth? Whereas uh, those with higher proportion of wealth in the village, uh, so so for example, in the village there is somebody who is uh, who has got proximity to the uh, political power in the village, and he is a non-Hindu. So untouchability with respect to such household may not be. Uh, so I may not be practicing untouchability with such a household. But if it's a poor household uh, with no proximity, say to political power, I might be practicing untouchability with such households. So will the, will the uh, function still be monotonic? Absolutely. So now let me just run run with the story that uh, that you just uh, just uh, spun. So if uh, an upper caste household will not practice untouchability vis-a-vis -a -vis, uh, uh, the lit household, which is relatively more powerful politically as compared to a household, Dalit household, which is not, right? That was, that was your story, isn't it? Yes, sir. Now, I'm just going to take that story one step further. So in a village where Dalit groups on an average are more powerful, the upper caste household will find that there is a larger proportion of Dalit households who are politically powerful enough not to mess with, right? Right. And, and if that is the story, then that should turn up in the data as a systematic difference in the propensity of households to practice untouchability. When I control for all other uh, household household specific factors, there will still be a systematic difference depending on how powerful the lets or other groups are in the village. And that's exactly where we are going with this. So you are essentially, uh, your, your point is essentially uh, what we are doing, except that we are extending it to village level uh, aggregates. Okay. okay thank you. And the point about preferences is the monotone transformation is not the household preference. The monotone transformation has to do with the proportions, the proportions of respondent households who admit to practice untouchability in any particular village. I mean, the obvious question here is, can we trust these proportions? Because this is uh, households themselves responding and they may be under-reporting, okay, right? So any proportions we calculate would be prone to underestimation. And uh, to that problem, our response is that that does not matter for our regression analysis, because all we need is the ranking across villages, not the actual numbers. Okay. Is that clear? Yes, sir. OK. So with all that caveat and defense in mind, we just give you some numbers. These are the overall proportions of households in the different rural areas of the different states in the survey who admit to practicing untouchability, not just upper caste or OBC, all, uh, all households. So as you can see, the at the top, it's Madhya Pradesh, Himachal, Bihar, 40% plus than all these states. And uh, if you take the national average, about 28.4%. That's, that's very high. Now, at the other end, 
you have Bengal and Kerala, complete outliers. Maharashtra is also something of an outlier because all the other states have at least 10% of respondents admitting to practice untouchability. So if we throw out Maharashtra and uh, uh, Maharashtra, Kerala and West Bengal, we end up with the 28.4% of the respondents uh, admitting to, to the practice. Whereas for India as a whole, it's about a quarter. So regardless uh, of how you look at it, it's, sorry, it's, Indra, it's still Indra, there. Indra, I just want to, uh, I might have missed this point. So did, uh, does the IHDS, is it like representative at the state level, this uh, data? No, I mean, no, no, no. So it's representative only at the household level. So this is, just just look at this purely in, ter in terms of, of uh, um, don't read anything too rigorous into it. It's just okay. sort of suggestive, okay? Okay. Yeah, so I was just wondering that there would be sampling biases. Uh, in the possible. The IHDS is representative at the household level. So that's why in our regressions, we will, we will run regressions on the at the household level, not at the village level, okay? And okay. we don't go into interstate... Uh, interstate comparisons there at all but this is uh, this is sort of just just to just at the level of um, of trying to fig find out some broad stylized facts all right mm -hmm. okay okay uh next what about different communities here uh asmita here uh, your problem no longer holds because since the since IHDS is representative at the household level, if I look at the community-specific propensities, then I don't face the problem that uh, I might face with the interstate, uh, across state comparisons. Okay. Okay. So, so look at the. So this is the. The first column is the population share. The second column is the land share. And this is, and look at the last column. This is the probability of practicing untouchability or likelihood conditional on being a Brahmin or being a forward caste. So, so the key numbers to look at are these conditional probabilities or the likelihood ratios in the fourth column. For Brahmins, it's the highest, not very surprising, pretty close to 60%. Forward costs is much lower, one third. And interestingly, there is hardly any difference between the propensity to practice untouchability, at least according to the IHDS, between forward castes and OBCs. 34%, uh, 32%. And uh, if you take Brahmins, forward castes, and OBCs together, then it's 34%. So Brahmins obviously are an outlying community, but the population proportion in the sample is, is tiny, 4%. So it can't be the case that the practice, which is so prevalent, is, is driven largely by Brahmins. Forward castes can constitute 14%. OBCs constitute 13%, uh, 35%. And... Uh, like I said, there is very little to choose between the behavior of forward castes, at least at this aggregative level, and that of OBCs. And additionally, notice that these are also land-rich communities. Their proportion, their land shares are significantly higher than their population shares. For OBCs, it's it's 
slightly higher than their population share, but higher nonetheless. For Brahmins and forward caste, it's much higher, almost double. What about other groups? Interestingly, STs seem to be practicing untouchability a lot. And this is something Thorat and Joshi also find. Their propensity to uh, their likelihood of practicing uh, uh, untouchability is about the same as the as as the uh, overall average. There's a significant amount of it even within SCs. So intra SC uh, untouchability seems to be significant within Muslims. Others meaning. Uh, meaning uh, Christians, Jains, uh, Sikhs, all the smaller groups. But most for it is the practice seems to be less prevalent, relatively uh, speaking, among Muslims and others, primary component of other being Christians. So in our formal analysis then, we are going to Ignore the STs, partly for the sake of uh, analytical tractability, keep life simple, and partly because of their small numbers, and uh, focus on the behavior of the first three groups, Brahmins, forward castes, and uh, OBCs. Now, because Brahmins are constitute such a small segment, we are going to dump the Brahmins with the forward castes, and that would give us the upper or general caste category. So we'll have the upper or general caste category, roughly 18% of the population, OBC 35%, and of course, uh, these, caste, these two castes then would be driving the, the practice in our our model and in our regression we will be looking at at uh, the determinants of the behavior of these these two groups with respect to untouchability any questions okay the so i'll just uh, walk you through the basic structure of the model quickly. The, I don't want to go into the, the formal intricacies of the model. If anybody is interested, we can talk about it afterwards. Uh, but the basic structure of the model is the following. You have a population of the village partitioned into four communities. As I, as I mentioned a minute ago, Hindu general castes, call that U, Hindu OBCs, B, SCs, S, and non-Hindus, M. Non-Hindus in our regression will just identify non-Hindus uh, with uh, Muslims and uh, Christians because other groups are tiny. So to uh, abstract from uh, problems of coordination within communities, We'll just simplify life and model each community as an individual. So capital H is the set of all non-SC Hindu individuals. Remember that there are no STs in our model. So these guys are just upper castes and backward castes. And each community in this four, with uh, uh, each community in this group of four different communities is endowed with some amount of resources, which is generated by combining its land endowment with its labor endowment, according to a simple multiplicative symmetric Cobb Douglas specification. For our theoretical purposes, we don't need any particular assumptions about the functional form, but for this is the functional form that we will use for our regression specification. So, you can forget about this. If all you are interested in is the theoretical structure, 
where you can just work with some abstract notion of resources. But for regressions, to give it empirical bite, this is the, the specification that we'll use. Theta is the, pro, is the proportion of resources going to the non-SC, that is upper caste and OBC block. What proportion of the total resources is controlled by the upper castes? That's theta. So in other words, theta is a measure of the dominance of upper castes within the upper caste and OBC lobby in terms of share of community resources. Obviously, this, this, this can vary in principle between 0 and 1. And each community allocates its resources between material consumption and conflict with other communities over division of two different non-economic or extra-economic normative goods. Think, think of these as the kinds of norms within the village that govern what is acceptable and what is not in terms of individual behavioral practice. So these are the normative goods at TNR. So R is, is simply the entire collection of, uh, of behavioral patterns, practices with a religious connotation. So you can think of fights over over whether the village, what proportion of the village land would be set aside for Muslim uh, burial grounds as opposed to being used for Hindu temples or, uh, in, uh, or for Hindu cremation. What proportion or to what extent cow slaughter would be acceptable within the village all these conflicts are captured in terms of conflicts over this religious good art. Whereas conflicts over things like whether the Dalits would be allowed inside a temple, the village temple, whether they would be allowed to draw water from the village well, whether there would be an Ambedkar statue in the, in, uh, the central village um, village meeting place. All these conflicts, this the the, uh, the collection of all such conflicts over caste issues between Hindu upper castes, OBCs on the one hand and uh, SCs on the other is captured, modeled rather, in terms of conflicts over this good T. So call that caste one. So just, that's just reiterating what I just said. He is the caste good, composite of social norms, rituals, conventions, which govern social interaction within the extended Hindu community. So that a larger share of P going to H implies that social norms and conventions within the village reflect more the values and prejudices of upper caste and backward castes, as opposed to those of Dalits. Similarly, a larger share of uh, T going to a, uh, going to H then means that there is greater tolerance or legitimacy of untouchability within the Hindu community, and therefore greater segregation of SCs. R is the religion good, so a greater share of R going to M means that the relative extent to which different public places, spaces within the village accommodate collective acts of symbolic and religious assertion. R, um, is it okay for, uh, for people to drink alcohol openly within the village? That's a kind of, that's the kind of uh, fights uh, over behavioral norms that is captured by this model in terms of this religion. 
The payoff function is a very simple structure. There is some private consumption, that's uh, material consumption, money, if you like, plus values from the, the, the valuation of the different, the two normative goods, the caste good and the religious good, weighted by the extent to which the village norms reflect the preferences of that particular group. So GIJ is simply the extent to which the village norms over the good J reflects uh, the preferences of the group I. And obviously, this G can vary from 0 to 1. There's some technical uh, restrictions I need, standard in other restrictions to ensure equilibrium, the kind of stuff that uh, you routinely do in a model, nothing very interesting. The main assumptions about the valuations that I make is the following. Muslims or uh, Christians, the non-Hindus, are really neutral with respect to the intra-Hindu practices governing upper caste, OBC, and SC uh, social interaction. So this valuation is zero. Doesn't matter, really. I can have a generalization where I allow this to be positive. That is, Muslims can have views on this, but it's not going to really make a difference. We discuss extensions in the, in the paper. Uh, uh, and obviously, the valuation of the uh, Muslims for the religious good is positive. Similarly, for uh, SCs, they don't really care much about the religious good, so they don't participate in the in the religious fight with non-Hindus. Uh, now again, this is for for to keep the algebra simple. Nothing nothing happens if I if I generalize this. One of the referees made a big deal out of this, and basically, uh, the the point that the, that the referee was making had to do with all these these uh, arguments about Hinduization of SC groups uh, since the Gujarat riots. And uh, that's something we can accommodate very easily without anything major, major happening. Uh, the valuation of the upper caste, uh, upper caste lobby for both, uh, the, both the religious good and the caste good, that's positive. And uh, similarly for the OBCs. And uh, this is where we use the one of the stylized facts that I showed you earlier. Remember, Looking at the averages, we found very little difference between forward castes and OBCs in terms of their propensity to practice untouchability. So that's that's what we are incorporating, building into the model through the assumption that these are uh, the valuations are equal. Again, uh, simplifies the algebra, but not crucial. So. M derives no benefit from the caste good, does not participate in the context over the, in the contest over the caste good. The uh, S derives no benefit from R. Both uh, the upper caste and backward caste are positive and identi identical valuations of both goods. And lastly, to close the model, I have to specify how the shares, the cross community shares are defined. And there, I just just throw in the standard Tullock contest success function, which is which is a standard simple way of modeling these kinds of conflicts. The share that any community gets simply depends on its resource allocation to fighting, as opposed to consumption, expressed as a proportion of the total resources spent on fighting. So the larger my resource expenditure of on 
fighting relative to that of the other group, the larger much share. That's the standard uh, dollar function. Similarly, for the religious group, and then uh, you do a bit of algebra, just assume that uh, the there is a public good characteristics of the social norms, and you end up with the following uh, following comparative static analysis, and that's our key theoretical result here, which we will uh, use for our empirical work. Let me, uh, instead of going into the equations of the algebra, let me just give you the equation. So think of an initial equilibrium situation where upper and backward caste Hindus collectively dominate both SCs and religious minorities. Dominate in what sense? In the minimal sense of receiving a larger share of both normatives. That is the village norms governing SC, non-SC interaction amongst Hindus or, or Muslim Hindu interaction are at least minimally biased towards upper and backward caste Hindus. Then the following, okay, A clarification, this must, this case, the upper and backward caste Hindus dominating both SCs and religious minorities in, the, in our minimal sense, this must hold if the total resource endowment of these groups is sufficiently greater than those of both SCs and non -SCs. That's That's pretty intuitive. But if that's the case, then any fall in the resource endowment of either non-Hindus or SCs must increase the extent to which the practice of untouchability is norm considered normatively legitimate. So if either Muslims and Christians or SCs become more powerful, then OBCs and non uh, and, and upper caste Hindus uh, would be less likely to practice untouchability. But any rise, uh, any rise in the resource endowment of non sc Hindus, if, if either OBCs are uh, given the share, given the level of dominance of upper caste vis-a-vis -vis OBCs, any rise in the resource endowment of OBCs and upper caste will, of course, have the same effect they will make untouchability more acceptable and therefore increase its likelihood. The, I think the most interesting bit here, apart from the fact that power of non-Hindus matters, is this one. What happens if the upper castes get, uh, uh, receive a larger share of the total resource endowment of non-Hindus that has a non-monotone effect. Starting from a situation where OBCs dominate the no, dominate forward castes, if I have a marginal redistribution of resources from OBCs to upper castes, the likelihood of untouchability being practiced by upper caste and obese will actually go down according to the model even though as we saw earlier brahmins are more likely to practice untouchability this tells you that in situations where obcs are dominant a marginal reduction in their their dominance would actually reduce untouchability even even if the resources go to Brahmins. But at the other end, when upper castes dominate backward castes, further improvements in the relative resource position causes greater dominance of upper caste ideas of ritual purity. So the relationship between upper caste power and the level of untouchability 
or the practice of untouchability that's not monotone. It has a U shape. It has an inverted U shape. Starting from very low levels, it uh, further increases in upper caste power, will actually reduce untouchability till you reach a, uh, reach a minimum, and then further increases will increase it. So that's, that's the <coughs> basic set of comparative static results. <coughs> Uh, what happens if uh, non-Hindus dominate? These results, the res results get overturned, but that requires the non-Hindu bloc to have a lot of resources. That doesn't really happen in our villages much. So uh, now let me just give you the empirical findings. So, like I said, we use IHDS 20, uh, 2012 rural household level data. And uh, we map that into village level and focus on non SCST households. We look at two different specifications because we want to capture the possible non monotonicity of the effect of theta on untouchability. That is the extent to which upper castes dominate OBCs. We need a specification, and we use two different specifications. The first one is the linear spines. That is, we estimate a <coughs> regression equation where the effect of theta is piecewise linear. What do we get? Well, there are three different specifications. The broadest specification is the uh, third equation. Let us just look at number three. Our uh, dependent variable is the likelihood or the probability that an upper caste or OBC household will practice untouchability. So what matters? Power of the upper caste plus OBC lobby. That's positive. Power measured by the simple multiplicative combination of land share and population share. Power of non-Hindus highly significant, has a strong significant negative effect on the propensity of an upper caste or OBC household to practice untouchability. Power of uh, SCs, strong negative effect. So for these, the model works. What about the non-monotonicity? Low levels of low deciles, one and two, negative. Negative at very high decile, decile 10 positive. So you do have the kind of U shape initially decreasing and subsequently increasing that the model predicts. The household is Brahmin, the effect is positive. That's what our initial averages told us to expect. Forward cost and OBC notice that the coefficients are very similar. So the even the regression results are telling us that forward cost Non-Brahmin forward castes behave more or less the same way as OBC households. Uh, sorry. What about occupations? Not much, nothing really matters. Well, laborers are supposed to be slightly less uh, less prone to the practice but it's not very the effect is not very strong what about infrastructure uh, exposure to urban norms seems to matter distance from nearest town the coefficient is positive so the further you are the further the village is from the nearest town presumably the less open it is to urban urban uh, values or it, the less exposed it is to urban uh, behavioral patterns 
more likely the upper castes or OBCs there are to practice untouchability. What if you have outside workers? It doesn't really matter. Infrastructure, Pakka Road, presumably that means greater market integration. That's a Gary Becker kind of story about discrimination. Greater marketing integration is likely to reduce discrimination in the, according to the Becker tradition of, of analysis of discrimination. Well, seems to work. The coefficient is, is significant and negative. So, Indrani, sir, sorry to interrupt you. I think uh, it's already yeah, five. I'm just wrapping up. I'm, yeah. I'm just wrapping. Give okay. me five minutes. Sure, I'm, sure, sure. I'm just... almost done. Yeah. yeah. So, schooling doesn't really seem to make any effect, to have any effect. Sorry, this is just jumping. Yeah. Schooling doesn't, doesn't seem to matter. The level of schooling of the household head doesn't really seem to matter. What if the, <coughs> this is the village has a, village, uh, is a, the Pradhan seat in the village is reserved for STs? Seems to make some difference. Uh, the direction is, uh, seems to be right. If the Pradhan is female, that then untouchability goes up. So having a Pradhan, a female Pradhan seems to be bad for SCs. More developed village, this is a composite measure of infrastructure that seems to support the Becker kind of story. Untouchability is lower. The, we also looked at the interaction terms. They have the more or less the right sign, but they don't give us very, anything very interesting. Uh, So, so the so the regression results more or less seem to support our our basic theoretical uh, hypothesis. Alternative formulation we <coughs> to look for the for the non monotonicity in <coughs> the effect of um, of uh, upper caste dominance vis a vis OBCs. We also use the quadratic specification again. Okay everything seems to work the way the model uh, model tells you they should upper caste power positive muslim power negative sc power negative the quadratic has the right right sign you have uh, the effect of greater upper caste power is initially negative good for scs initially and then bad for scs as upper caste become very strong all the other things are more or less the same. So, so that's basically uh, what what we get. And I'll just conclude with. Uh, can I can I take another three four minutes, Asmita? Yes, sure, sure, go ahead. Okay, so let me just uh, after we uh, did the paper, we got interested in looking at the outlier states. And with, uh, certainly with Asmita's caveat in mind that the data is not representative at the state level. Nonetheless, it's the numbers, the broad patterns are, are more or less tally with our intuition. So we, we just wanted to look at, on the one hand, Kerala and West Bengal and uh, Maharashtra. And uh, on the other, other side, we looked at Madhya Pradesh, Bihar, and uh, Himachal. Now let's first look at uh, the ranking of states according to the propensity of rural non-SCST Hindus. The earlier table that I showed you looked at the propensities for all groups. This is only for uh, all rural groups. This is for rural non-SCST Hindus. And uh, Madhya Pradesh, Himachal, and Bihar are at the top. And uh, like earlier, Kerala, West Bengal, Maharashtra at the bottom. Goa is, but Goa is too tiny, so we don't we don't look at Goa. <coughs> uh, now, just sort of as uh, as kind of running these these uh, cases 
through the ideas in our model or our broader analysis, what's happening in West Bengal? Look at the average share, population share of SCs in uh, that is 31 percent and their land share is close to 28 percent so not only does the average non sest hindu person live in a village in west bengal where there is a almost one third of the population is sc these are also SCs who own a very high amount of land by Indian standards. This is far, far higher than the corresponding proportion for India as a whole. And also, the proportion in, in the hypothetical representative village where the average represent or representative upper caste or OBC Hindu individual lives in West Bengal, about 20% of the population is Muslim. It's Muslim and Christian. There are very few Christians in West Bengal. So 21%. And the, and the Muslims also own a massive, by Indian standards, a massive proportion of land. So our conjecture is that what's driving low untouchability in West Bengal is basically the far more equitable distribution of land compared to other states, uh, whereby both Muslims and uh, SCs land shares are more or less proportional to their population share and numerical strength also of these two communities also very high. So in that sense, the land reform measures in Bengal under the left front seem to have played a that made a difference if if that's what kind of story you want to run with. Now notice Kerala. Kerala is very different. Despite the with the left uh, history and all that stuff, the population share of SCs is not uh, is is not low. It's twelve percent, but the land share of SCs in Kerala is tiny. The con contrast with West Bengal could not be more stark. So SCs hardly own any land in, in Kerala. So in the context of our model, how do I explain the low levels of untouchability? Well, the population share of Muslims and Christians, and as well as their share of land is extremely high here. So the slack that you have in terms of SC land holdings in Kerala, that is picked up probably by the high land share of Muslims and Christians in, in, uh, in Kerala. So the explanation for low untouchability is probably very different between West Bengal and Kerala. The other thing I want, to sh want you to show is selected characteristics of the rural areas. Infrastructure-wise, Kerala is far better than West Bengal. So pos it's quite possible that the better kind of effects, the market integration, close closeness to a town, these things are playing, market processes are playing a far greater role in reducing untouchability in Kerala as opposed to West Bengal. In West Bengal, all the heavy lifting is being done by land and equitable distribution of land and large population share of SCs. And, and, and maybe maybe the left's land redistribution uh, uh, is, a, is a major causal factor there. But whatever be the case, the explanations seem to be very different between Kerala and West Bengal. High uh, untouchability states, Maharashtra, uh, Madhya Pradesh, Bihar, what you'd expect. Uh, there is a uh, very, very little land owned by SCs. Even when their pop population share is significant, as in MP, land share is very low. 
And in Bihar, where you have a reason, reasonably high Muslim uh, population share, the Muslims will hardly own any land, so not much countervailing power here. And in Madhya Pradesh, it's practically, practically uh, uh, no Muslims around. So not much countervailing power there. And uh, in there isn't much conflict between uh, within the upper caste and OBC lobby. The relative power of upper caste vis-a-vis -vis OBCs is very low, in both MP and Bihar. So OBCs dominate within the upper caste and OBC group in both states. But that's but but our model then tells us that those are the situations where, or rather, dominance of one group, whether upper caste or OBC, is going to be bad for SCs. That's another factor that might might be might might be an explain, explain, one explanation for the high level of untouchability in MPLBR. Okay, so that's it. Questions, comments. <laughs> Thanks, uh, this was really an excellent presentation. Uh, I would request people to uh, quickly ask questions or comments if they have any. Uh, Sir, uh, I just wanted a quick uh, uh, clarification. Would be a wrong word to use for you, but just for my understanding. Uh, sir, in the in one of the tables in the uh, when which you had shown earlier, uh, you had said that the SC population was practicing all the proportion of SC population was practicing almost. Uh, uh, so two point two, I think, was the number. Two point two percent SC population practicing untouchability. Which was almost. Uh, hang on, let me just go to the paper. Table. I think uh, here, this is table here. number two. This is the one. Yeah, and uh, this is the one. Yeah. Yes, and the Brahmins. Uh, so again, they are also two point two percent. Yes. So how much of the untouchability uh, that you uh, the final results that we have obtained from the regression? How much do you attribute to, you know, the intra community? Uh, uh, untouchability practices and how much to inter-community Right, right. No, uh, notice that in our regressions, we are, we are our dependent variable is the propensity of an upper caste or OBC person to household to practice untouchability, right? So okay. intra-SC practice of untouchability is something we are not looking at at all in the regressions. And what about, uh, so uh, upper caste, propensity of upper caste, that would include both U and B, right? Yes, upper, no. Upper caste is, is Brahmin forward, okay. plus forward caste, that is uh, U, the, that's U, this is U. Upper or general caste, there's Brahmin plus forward caste, plus OBC. Okay, that is my H. This is the category. I have around 13,000 households here who are either Brahmin or forward caste or OBC. So, the, that is... You effectively that is rule out intra-caste uh, untouchability. Yes, caste. yes, intra-SC untouchability. Yes. Uh, so I don't I want to go one... there. Bec ah, yeah. I don't want to go there because that's a, that's a fascinating question, but I don't have... Uh, Fine enough data to look into it in the, from this in this uh, uh, data set. So so that's why we avoid that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Very Thank good you. question there. Uh, Professor Dalta, I think uh, there are a few questions in the chat box. <laughs> okay. Let me go into the chat box. Yeah. Uh, so, I have uh, comments. I'm Hang sure. Like, Hang on. Uh, now, how do I go into so, the chat box? So, yeah. uh, right, right, right. 
Can you see there's one question uh, where is the comment yes, by Barbara? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so the question about clarifying similar simultaneous religious conflict, Hindus, Muslims, contextual, is that clear or do you, Yeah, uh, no, do that we, is answered. And then okay, uh, the, someone or wanted to calculating do... land share. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this this is this is there in the data. The the data set provides us um, uh, uh, for each village. It uh, tells us what proportion of village land is owned by the different communities. What we what we do not have is the absolute size of land ownership because uh, the villages are anonymized. So we don't. Uh, so. We only have uh, proportions, not the absolute amounts. Now, for uh, optimally, I would have liked to do it with actual uh, actual land holding, total land size. But uh, it probably doesn't make that much of a difference, given that we are working with about 1,100 villages. Probably won't make that much difference. OK? Yeah. Ah. Right, next question. Right. Yes, yes, Barbara, Barbara's question. Uh, see, Barbara, uh, I am I am still in, in two minds about this. I think uh, the village, the analysis has to be grounded in some notion, in, in some kind of, uh, some, uh, some idea of structural power at a lower level, not, uh, but at, the, at a level above the individual. Now, is the village the determining analytical unit or something slightly broader Maybe the block level, that's something I don't know. I mean, I can't really say that without, uh, without having an alternative data set where I can do this kind of analysis for different levels of disaggregation. Maybe even Mahola level for large villages, maybe even Mahola level or maybe subdivision level. Different. I need to really see this. This or some variant of this done at at different uh, different levels of disaggregation and see what turns up. So, uh, so the focus on the village in this in this sense it makes intuitive sense. It is doable given the data we have. But is a but. Is the politi is the distribution of power in some sense, in our sense, or in some other sense, really village specific or broader? Uh, there are um, uh, spillovers across villages within a subdivision or within a block. That's a question I really want to want to look at, but I don't have the data to 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 address it as of now. Right. Mm. So I just uh, want to uh, yeah, clarify. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah uh, this is this. Uh, this uh, let, let me just go back to the question about land holding, and then I'll go back to the the, the question that was just just now. So, in the aggregate land holding by communities, yes, oh yes, oh yes, more productive land and less productive land. Absolutely, absolutely the quality of land ownership uh, uh, land holding irrigated or non irrigated that would be a, that would definitely be a factor uh, we don't have that fine grained data so we definitely need to uh, in principle that should be there has to be some kind of normalization in terms of optimally we would like our land holding is proxying for wealth so optimally, we would like a completely com uh, comprehensive measure of wealth, which both land and non-land wealth holding. We don't have that. Then we should optimally have land normalized according to productivity.
usually done. Irrigation, uh, irrigation facilities, uh, we don't have that. The, um, so I completely agree. That is, a, that is an important factor, but not much we can do about it. But having said that, again, my, my defense would be the large number issue. We have a countrywide sample, 1,100 villages, so maybe this won't matter that much. Because, again, notice that it's not the absolute level of land, land share of SCs that matters for me. It's changes in that share. Okay. So if, if everywhere SCs hold less productive land, that doesn't make uh, that does not make any difference to the regression results. All right. Uh, Raju. Uh, then there was a question about community level conflict. Yes, yes, yes. Very good question. Uh, IHDS gives information. Mobile ka jo sent hota hai. Sorry, somebody is like talking. That's okay. That's okay. Okay, no problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, IHDS gives information on community level conflict. It does. And we did try this. The problem is the data, the data, the conflict data is very, uh, it's very rough. It just asks questions like, is there uh, a lot of conflict at, uh, at the village level, some conflict? It, it's the, that con, the, it's not fine grained enough for for our purposes. So we tried this and we decided uh, to let it go. Theoretically, all the results are there in the paper. We know exactly how uh, aggregate conflict should behave, its relation with untouchability. We have a model which completely predicts the intensity and direction of both caste conflict and communal conflict. We don't, <coughs> we don't want to use the IHS data to do the conflict regressions because we don't like the data on conflict there. What we are yeah. playing with, and this is going to be our next, next spin-off paper, we want to work out a broader data sets for yeah, class conflict yeah. and communal yeah. conflict. Like, you know, you can, uh, you can uh, work out uh, uh, some measure of caste conflict from this crimes, crime data, crimes against SCSTs. Uh, that could be one, one rough measure of, of caste conflict. And you have this by now standard Vashney Wilkinson set on uh, set, data set on communal conflict. So we are playing with this idea of using those those kinds of extra data sets and running the conflict related results of our model through that data. I, uh, that I just is, that a, is absolutely sorry. I just yeah. have a quick question in this. I was just wondering, uh, like, if you find differences across, uh, like, say, urban and rural areas, or is it possible to? Uh, we we have we, we have the urban urban uh, numbers in the paper the mm -hmm. uh, small town pretty much the same as villages metro mm -hmm. areas there is a dramatic fall in uh, un incidence of untouchability right. and why is it uh, so maybe it's the op i mean they have less dependence on land as a resource do you think that that uh, we we did not we did not focus on urban areas precisely for this reason our land is is not necessarily the principal component or the or the, or the best proxy for wealth assets in urban contexts but what is we don't have a good proxy for community uh, community level wealth holding in the urban context. And we don't have a good feel for what might be a good proxy. So that's why we, we have not looked at urban areas at all, right? But okay. there, is a, there is an open issue here. Why is it that metro areas seem to be doing fine 
negligible levels of uh, untouchability, but small small towns are about as bad as villages. There is a further disaggregation between more developed villages and less developed villages. More developed villages are doing much better, but that's also turning up in our our regressions. Uh, that's that's intuitive. Why are small towns doing so badly in this sense? I don't know. Quite open question. So uh, yeah. sorry, Indranil. I think. Uh, ah, sure. We need uh, yeah. to see your photo a bit, uh, I mean your video a bit, because uh, 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 like we are trying to take a screenshot. So good evening. Right. Uh, just, just good evening, sir. Answer. I have one more question. Uh, can, can I good just evening, answer sir. this one? Can I just answer one question which came up about female pradhans in one yeah, line? Yeah, and then I'll sure. go to the last one. Yeah, uh, the question was that female pradhan is not good for SCs because it in, uh, increases the prevalence of untouchability. Yes. Does it depend on the cost of the female pradhan? There, in our data set, there's hardly any female pradhan who's not upper caste. And that is what's driving this. Okay. How would an SC female pradhan uh, behave? I don't know because there are so few of them here. So that is that is the issue, and uh, uh, good evening, sir. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, yes sir, I have one confusion. Uh, uh, so, please go to the twenty-four uh, your page number. So I have one confusion there. Right, right. Twenty-four. Okay. Uh, Uh, so, sir, table number Hello, two, please. you stated hang that. On, hang, on, uh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. 20, uh, this one, right? Yes, yes sir, the, the, the upper part. Yes. Yes, yes, this yes, is right. Yes. Hmm. Sir, okay. you have stated here the distribution of rural population and land share across caste hmm. or religion group in the states hmm. with lowest. West Bengal, Kerala, and Madhya Pradesh, and as well as highest. No, 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 Madhya Pradesh. Say I. Uh, West Bengal, Kerala, yes, and Maharashtra and are the low ones. Hmm. So you are mentioning here MP, West Bengal, Kerala, and MP. MP it is will be here. Maharashtra. No, 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 no. MP is here. This is MP Bihar. MP and Bihar are the high ones. Okay. Okay. So that means this is uh, West Bengal, Kerala, Maharashtra, low ones. MP very okay, high. Okay. We are very high. Okay. 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 Sir, actually, I have confused. There, are, there are both, both of them, lowest and highest. There are men's and MP. That's why I have confusion. No, 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 okay. no, 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 no. It's Maharashtra. This is Maharashtra is low. MP is very high. Okay. I think there okay. is just Thank one you, sir. more. You're welcome. Uh, one more question. I'll, let me just answer that and then I'll turn the screen thing uh, on. Yeah. The yeah. video on. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, thank you. I mean, I'm asking the same question that I put on the uh, chat box. Just that the last part oh. I want to replay. So, hmm. I mean, are there positive experiences, say, for instance, because of the, uh, you know, constitutional law provisions, like in case of Dalit, you know, in terms of untouchability in rural India, as per your. Uh, yeah. Data? Yeah. And Look at the. Uh, let me go back to the regression that will you have I'll answer that there. Look at the regression coefficient for Pradhan SC reserved. It's negative. So seems like having an SC Pradhan does make a difference, does benefit SCs, at least in this context. So, uh, so my answer would be a guarded yes in the context of uh, Pradhan reservation. Okay. Okay. And my second uh, question is, when there uh, are a cluster of villages, you know, uh, yes. how does this untouchability caste wealth equation operate in the yes. uh, periphery of the villages and in the uh, centrally concentrated uh, set of clusters? Are there, uh, I mean... Have you done anything? Oh, we don't. We don't know. We don't have the. We don't have that. That uh, that fine uh, uh, division of uh, within a village. We just had some uh, some uh, information about whether there were separate mahallas in the village. 
uh, we, we tried that as an independent measure of untouchability. Yeah, nothing, it doesn't give us much. I mean, nothing is, nothing really, really turns out to be, um, to be significant. Um, but, and uh, this kind of uh, division, this is, this is also connected to Barbara's question earlier. Barbara's point about whether the village is the right, right unit for analysis. Maybe, uh, at least for larger villages, maybe we would like to go uh, at, at a, to a more disaggregated level. Or maybe uh, to a more aggregated level. Maybe the subdivision is the right, uh, right unit. I don't know. Because, because I don't have this alternate uh, data, alternatives in terms of data, right? So I, I really don't know what's going on. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Is there any other question? I think there are two more questions in the chat. Uh, thanks. OBC is too broad. Heterogeneous a category. Yeah, 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 we tried that as well. It's uh, the, the way the disaggregation works in the IHDS data, IHDA data set, it's far too disaggregated. Like for each state within OBC, we have like 20, 30 jatis. How does one, uh, how does one do any kind of aggregative analysis with that finer division, you know? That's the problem. I completely agree that OBC is too broad, upper caste is too broad, everything is too broad. But one has to maintain a balance. If we go into too fine a distinction, we can't do any aggregative analysis. Then it's things become uh, unmanageable. Right. And uh, education level. In West Bengal and Kerala, education level may be a, fa a factor. But the movement, possibly, obviously, there are all kinds of other factors uh, that that uh, may be working here is perfectly possible. I'm certainly not saying that uh, the only the factors that we have highlighted in our regression are uh, relevant, but uh, I'm just, just flagging up the stark difference between Kerala and West Bengal in terms of SC land holdings and infrastructure. And our model does have something to say about, about possible differences in in uh, in the processes which lead to low untouchability in Bengal and Kerala. Okay. And that was the question about educational level and OBC. I think that's 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 all the questions I had in chat. Any other question or should I turn on the video now? Yeah, I think in Sanila, I think uh, the people oh, are right. here, they really need to uh, take a picture of... Uh, oh, right. Right. All right. <laughs> yeah, so so how, uh, how do I do this? I st uh, you stop sharing I, the screen. I think. And stop sharing the screen. Okay. Right. Okay. Is that Can fine? you see me uh, at all? Uh, or the... I mean, is that fine? Uh, can you just... I mean... Um, do something I, I, about I, the light. Yeah. Uh, hang on. <laughs> yeah, sir, your picture is a little bit dark. It's not a player, no? Suraj ji, are you trying to... Is that please guide... Yes. Is that better? It's a little bit more, sir. It's quite dark, actually. Yeah. Uh, now, how do I do that? Actually, I think let me try it's something. It's... Uh, just the, yeah, just let it be. Yeah, I think uh, maybe we can just send some other photo of yours. It will be. Why don't you just use the for uh, the couple of photos on mine online? Just use those. What do you think? Is that, Suresh, is that fine? Suresh ji, yes. hello. Yeah, it's okay, Suresh. 
Yeah, it's okay. I think. Yeah. Ah, just, just, just use the one that's on my website as a website. Ah. So, uh, I'm sorry, but I will have to like uh, disconnect the meeting now. I'm sure, like I myself had a few questions and clarifications, but I think you know, we will uh, talk, continue talking on this. Uh, but absolutely, uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Indonesia, for this excellent paper. I think. Uh, uh, it, it, it was a great pleasure as well as honor to hear from you and hope uh, that uh, you'll uh, keep, we'll keep hearing from you in future as well. Thanks a lot for taking your time and presenting this to us. Thanks a lot. I had a great time and thanks for all the questions. Very useful for, uh, for our future work. And if anybody is interested in, uh, in uh, chasing up the issues there, in the paper or even the broad set of issues, please feel absolutely free to get in touch, email me, and this is my my thinking on these issues, are sort of evolving uh, as I as I keep working on these things. So I'd love to hear from you if if you anything strikes or if there any any extension you want you can think of. Okay, and thanks again, Ashmita for inviting Thank me. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. I'll just disconnect. Yeah. I'll just leave. Yeah, maybe. Suraj, do you, no, do you yes, want to yes, end yes. the meeting? Yes, we can end the meeting. Thanks, sir. Yeah, thanks.